Good afternoon or good morning everybody. Thanks for joining today's webinar which is all about portrait editing. Uh, now there's lots to do today so we're going to get straight into it as quick as possible. Uh, for those of you on Facebook and YouTube, uh, welcome. Feel free to put your questions, comments in there. We are monitoring monitor can't speak today. We are monitoring them uh, as well as myself, Yulia and Diego, uh, Diego across the channels as well. If you're in the webinar room and you want to ask a question, try to keep it to the Q&A tab. It just helps to separate it out from the main chat. But do feel free to use the main chat for heckling, abuse and talking amongst yourself as well. If you want a bit more room in the webinar room, then do uh, hide the chat and that will just give you a bit more space on screen as well. So let us begin. So the purpose of today is to look at various different portrait edits. Uh, we're also going to look at a couple of new styles that came out today as well. So hold that thought and new toys for demonstrating. I've also picked up this little gadget for mouse highlighting. So I'm going to test it out with you guys today. If you find it irritating, do let me know. Equally, if you find it useful, uh, do let me know as well. So we've got some great shots, as you can see on screen. We won't have time to edit all of them. So we're at least going to edit the one from Joe, uh, John McDermott, Brandy, who's online. Hi, Brandy. Uh, Danielle Siobhan and one from Kish as well. And we might use the others to demonstrate a few other bits and pieces as well. So that's the plan. OK, let's dive straight in. So the first one we're going to look at is this one from Joe McNally. So give a shout out to Joe's Instagram handle underneath there. And each of the pictures that I've chosen um, just hope to point out a different technique. Now, of course, if these aren't the kind of portrait shots that you do, don't worry. Uh, you can always apply these various techniques to your own work. But I've tried to vary the kind of content we have and the various different features, so it's uh, a broad range. All right. So the reason for picking this one was a couple of things. One, to show you one of the new styles, and two, to give you a look at uh, a nice little neat trick with making radial masks, which is often useful in portraiture. Before we get to that, uh, base adjustments, exposure, brightness is all pretty good. I'm going to lift the brightness up a touch just to get a bit more mid-tone brightness. The reason I'm not picking exposure is that the fella's fantastic beard here, the highlights were already fairly brightish. So if we pull the exposure up, that's going to make that lighter as well. And it's kind of at a nice density as it is. So I'm just going to pull up the brightness a touch and then fly down to our levels here and click auto, which will just pull in the uh, highlights and shadow points at either end, which gives us a nice base contrast as well. And really that's all this photo needs in that respect, in terms of exposure, tonal adjustment, and so on. One adjustment you won't see me using a lot today is clarity, generally because often skin tones fall into a mid-tone. So if we start to add clarity, it just pulls those tones further away, adding more contrast. Uh, and it's not necessarily super flattering. Like in this kind of shot, if we added, let's zoom out a touch, a little bit of clarity. In this shot, it works okay. <clears throat> but because clarity is mostly working on the mid-tones, you can see on his nose and around here and everything, generally it's not giving us a good result. So I tend to shy away from using clarity on portraiture, unless you really want to accentuate some you know, deep, crusty, dark features or whatever. But generally, we're going to stay away from that. Now, to finish this shot, or almost finish it, we've got a slight bit of skin redness here, which we can get rid of with one of the new style brushes. So on this photo, we're going to look at quick fix using a style brush. <clears throat> and then when we go to this shot down here with Danielle, then we're going to use the skin tone tool just so you can see the difference between the two of them. But first of all, uh, by default, you will find a new tool called style brushes, normally in the exposure tool tab. If you don't see it, then you need to check your capture one version and make sure you're on 14.1 because that's when style brushes were added. 
What I've done is take out style brushes from my exposure tool tab and make my own custom tool tab just with layers and style brushes. Purely because on a laptop screen, I'm starting to run out of room to fit all the various different tools in together. So this is a way of just separating, separating out these two. If you're not sure how to make a custom tool tab, right click and just say add tool tab and custom and the rest is pretty obvious. And then you can just add whatever tools with a right click in that particular tool tab. So built in style brush, let's expand these out. And I'm going to grab red skin reduction. As soon as I click that, it selects my brush cursor tool. So I'm immediately ready to brush on my subject. Uh, now that brush is a little bit too big because it's going to spill over into his eyes and things. So I'm just going to right click and bring that down a bit and make it a bit softer. Now when you pick a style brush or when you make your own style brush, you can also preset the brush size and parameters as well to give you that speedy extra step as well or save you having to do it manually. Now all I need to do now is start brushing and something to point out, you'll notice that most of the style brushes that we made, the built-in ones, start with a very low flow. The exception is the Iris Enhance, which we might use today, we shall see. Uh, but they start with a very low flow, so that means you can build up the adjustment slowly. So having a low flow, in this case it was around seven. So that means as I brush, it's going to build up the adjustment nice and slowly. So it just gives you that opportunity to stop when the adjustment is enough. But it also means that it builds up very subtly. So when you're doing something like this, let's just do a little bit more and a bit up here. Sometimes you might just want to stop, turn the layer off and then see what's happening. So you can see it's just taking out some of the redness on the bridge of his nose there, like that. Simple. Now there's no mystery to what these are doing. If we go to the color editor and the advanced color editor, you can see exactly what that style brush is doing. So it's changing the hue a bit and pulling the saturation down, but it just puts all those steps together for you so you don't have to do it. Okay, now what I really wanted to show you on this shot was a little bit about radial mask, which are masks which are often quite common to use. There is a vignetting tool right down here at the bottom and often this works great. The only thing about the vignetting tool is that you don't have any control on where the shape starts and stops, if you like, the vignette. And it's preset to which tones it brightens or darkens. Now it does a really excellent job. So if you want to put a vignette on, that's a good place to start. But the reason why I'm not going to use it on this shot is if we pull the vignette down, is that it's really starting to make these areas down at the bottom a bit too dark for my liking because these are already in shadow I don't necessarily want to make them any darker so using a radial mask gives us the ability to pick the adjustments that we want to apply on our radial and also do a clever trick with luma masking so I'm going to grab my radial mask over here where I start drawing on the photo, that's where the mask is going to burst out from, if you like. Dragging any of those corners will uh, change the feathering. So if I press M on my keyboard, then you can see exactly what the mask looks like. If I want to rotate it, I can hover in the middle line and just pop it something like that. And we can squash the shape or expand it by picking up any of those handles. So there's my vignette pressing M on my keyboard so you can see the mask. Now, you can use any of the tools to do what you want with that vignette. Uh, generally, I don't uh, use the exposure tool. Why? If we pull exposure down, it's getting too dark down here because exposure will drop all the tones in the photo at the same rate. So highlights, mid-tones, shadows, everything gets darker. So choice number two would be to pull the brightness down. And what brightness does is just drop the mid-tone, so the shadows will get less affected. Don't forget you can combine anything else, or if you want to be super fancy, you can of course find a curve, and then you can pull down exactly which bits you want as well. But another fun thing that you can do, let's just uh, pull down exposure for a second. 
which is the one I said I wasn't going to use. We can always move our vignette around. So right now our radial mask looks like this. Now to see it in grayscale, you can either choose grayscale mask here, Alt M. So I'm going to hit Alt M on my keyboard. There's a little annoying bug that if you're already in the mask, it won't flick to grayscale, which we know we need to fix. So just use Option M or choose it straight away in that menu and then you can pick it up. So what are we looking at here? Um, oh, <laughs> Thomas. Thanks, Thomas. Saving my bacon. You just added the radial to your red skin layer. Damn it, David. Um, let's do that again. So luckily you can see the uh, red skin reduction once more. But fortunately, style brushes are so quick, I did it on purpose just to show you how quick it is. So let's uh, come out of my radial mask. Uh, sorry, my grayscale mask. Do that quickly again. Brush, brush, brush. See how fast that is. Make myself a new layer. Call that radial. And now we can begin. But you can see how fast it is using um, the style brushes. Thanks, Thomas. Thank God you mentioned that. Okay, let's put the radial back where it should be. I had it something like that. Looks good. And we want to go to grayscale mask, or actually I want to pull the exposure down first, reposition that, and option M, grayscale mask. Thanks, Thomas. All right, so what we can do is put a luminosity constraint on top of that radial mask by simply telling Capture One, stay away from the shadows. So if we grab our Luma range button, and I want to make sure we include all the highlights and just pull it this way a bit, and cut out the shadows. So anything that's turning black means we're not going to affect on our adjustment anymore. So now it's protected. So those darker areas, and we could go up as far as we wanted. Let's do something like that. So we're going to get our darkening in the white areas, but those dark, uh, the black areas are going to stay untouched. So let's go to something like that. So it's going to protect those darker wrinkly bits in his shirt. Now with radius on zero, this is a relatively binary mask. There's, there's not much finesse to it. So if we bump up the radius, this then activates the sensitivity slider. Forgot I've got my new toy. Uh, the sensitivity slider underneath. And what this does is change the behavior of how the edges are handled. So if we go down to zero, then it will feather that quite nicely. If we go up to 100, then it will find edges. So see how it's snapped to all the edges. Now we don't really want to find the edges in this scenario. We want to keep it a bit softer. So I'm going to compromise around there. So now we've still got our radial, but we've told Capture One to stay away from the darker areas. And at any point, we can always go back in, grab our Luma range, and then we can play around with this you know, to our heart's content. So you can always go back in and, and refine it. Okay, so now when we pull down our, you know, exposure, if I just really pull that down, obviously that doesn't look good, but you can see the areas that it's protecting. So now with a little combination of brightness and exposure, we can get ourselves a vignette without killing any of those nasty areas. And I see we've got a slight little issue there, but as I said, we can always go back into the Luma range I'll probably just bump up the sensitivity a bit, see how that halo disappears, and then pull that down in that direction, and then now we're good. So that's the nice thing about the Luma range, it's not a permanent fixture. So if you're using a radial, think about what adjustments you're going to use, and think about which are those best adjustments, how they interact with the photo. Worst comes to the worst, you can always play around with the Luma range, and with any layer, you can always pull down the opacity to moderate it exactly how you want. So if that's too strong, we can just come back to something like that. There we go. All right, um, let's have a look at a couple of questions. So thanks again to Thomas for saving my bacon. Um, <laughs> and let's check other questions. So I know Diego's in the webinar room beavering away. Um, Alan says, why would you not reduce the highlights given the overexposure on the nose on his right cheek? Is it overexposed? I'd say it was overexposed to be honest, but for you, Alan, 
we can go to the background and then we could pull the highlights down a little bit. Actually, it's quite a good example, this photo. Look what happens when we pull the highlights. See where it's acting on the photo. It's doing his beard, it's doing a little bit of his face. If we pull the whites, see how it's more restricted just to those brighter tones. So Alan, as we're being nice, let's pull down the whites a bit and the highlights a touch as well. And then I would stop there. Cool. Let's go on to the next photo because I know I'm going to overrun because I did this morning. So we're moving quite quick here. So you can always um, watch the replay if anything's a bit too speedy. Right, let's look at the shot of Danielle. So let's go and grab this one. Almost started editing the JPEG then. That would have been interesting. So we're going to look at this picture of Danielle and then we're going to compare it to this one. I know it's two different shots, but it's quite a good demo of how dynamic range can differ between cameras as well or, or how to play that tug of war with the exposure and the high dynamic range tools. So this is a shot from Danielle Chavon. You can find her on Instagram as well. This is actually herself, a uh, self-portrait, one of the two self-portraits we're gonna look at today. And the reason why I picked this one out is because it was a good illustration of when it makes sense to pick a pro standard profile over the older generic profile. Now I won't give you the full uh, pro standard spiel now. If you're interested in the difference between pro standard or the improvements, then I did a live broadcast two days ago with Niels. Uh, he's really the, the brains or one of the brains behind camera pro profiling amongst the team of, of guys and girls who, who do that. Uh, so if you want to know more about pro standard, go back and watch that. But one of the takeaways from it is the way the pro standard profile handles skin tones. Now in the base characteristics tool, you'll always see that Capture One will pick the profile for your camera automatically. So we've got uh, Danielle's using a 5D Mark IV and we can see the generic profile, which is the default currently, or we can flick to Pro Standard. So I'm gonna choose Pro Standard. And what we're gonna do is, is put our before and after slider up and just have a look at, I'll zoom in a bit closer, have a look at the highlight on her fingers where it's very bright in highlights. So in the previous profile, what we would see is that when skin tones move towards uh, highlight, then they can get a little bit yellow. When they go to shadow, they can start to move to red. But if we look at the pro standard profile, so that's old generic profile, and this is pro standard, notice how it's a lot more neutral on the brighter areas of her skin, like so. So that's why this photo is a good example. And it's also a good example of uh, the previous shot where we use the style brush. This shot, we're gonna use the skin tone tool just so you can see the difference between the two. Now it takes longer to use the skin tone tool, but you could argue you'll also get um, a higher level of accuracy. So let's start off by editing this. Now it's a little bit on the dark side. The 5D, if we bump up the exposure, now I'd be mindful of not going too bright because Danielle's edit We've got a JPEG here, this is Danielle's edit, so she kept it moody and dark. I'm probably gonna go a bit brighter so we can see what the skin tone tool can do. So if I pull up the exposure, obviously, obviously it's getting too hot here, but if we pull the highlights down, we can easily recover that. Let's just zoom in. So this is zero, and then if we pull down our highlights, then there's tons of data there that we can pull back. Now we could go as far as, sorry, that, there's this really frustrating bug. There we go, with my current Wacom driver sometimes thinks I'm holding down a modifier key. So I'll try and click and it will right click or shift click or whatever and it takes a couple of seconds to disappear. So if you see me erring at any point, then that's why. Okay, what was I saying? Yeah, highlights. Would I bring it all the way down to minus 100? Probably not, because if we did that, it just looks super unnatural now. That really doesn't look great. So I'm just gonna compromise and go roughly halfway, because we want 
that feeling, of course, that it is a brightly lit sunlight window. So let's do that. So there it looks good. Um, I will open up the shadows slightly and I'm going to pull the blacks down just so the shadows don't get too flat. I mean, there's tons of dynamic range here, but it was shot mean and moody. So let's keep it mean and moody. All right. Um, no contrast or just a couple of points and no clarity again, as I said before. So again, the reason why I picked this shot was mostly to talk about the skin tone tab of the advanced color editor in contrast to the style brush that we used earlier. Now, all of us have some variation in skin tone. It's very easy in Capture One to pull it together to uh, a target, if you like. So to pick your target skin tone and collapse everything to that target. So the way we do that is in the color editor and the skin tone tab. However, I personally will always do this on a layer because it gives us much more control over the end result. So we're going to make a new field layer. I'll explain why in a second called skin tone like so. The reason why we're doing a field layer, so if I press M on my keyboard, you can see why. The reason why we're doing that is because first of all, we can dial in the right adjustments for Danielle's skin tone, and then we can decide where to apply it. Now there's a quick and dirty way of doing it, but again, I don't think it gives you the same level of finesse. So I will always default to this. Okay, so uh, we're gonna go to the skin tone tab. We're gonna grab our color picker down here like so. And we're going to look on our subject and decide what is my target skin tone? What do I want everything to look like or be close to? So I'm going to go just around here, like so. Now, as soon as I click, we get this going on in the color wheel. So the dot that you can see there, if I just hover over that, that is my picked skin tone. Now the range here, this is the fishing net, if you like, of all the skin tones I want to catch and transform to that pick point. Now, as I'm going to do this on a layer, I'm going to be a bit brazen and open up this range as much, much as possible. Now, of course, there's a danger of picking up something that I don't want to transform to the skin tone, but as we're going to change our layer, it doesn't matter. So I just want to collect with my color fishing net, if you like, all the incorrect skin tones so that they can be compressed down to that picked point, which we just chose. So now looking underneath, we've got two banks of sliders. We have the amount sliders, which will simply change the appearance of the picked skin tone. So if I suddenly desaturate, then we're gonna lose all the saturation. If I suddenly open up the lightness, the skin tone's gonna to get brighter. But these sliders, have a relatively narrow range. So they're meant for subtle, small adjustments. Now these three sliders are different. So the further you drag them to the right, the further everything in that triangle gets pulled to that target point. And it becomes very obvious on this shot, which is why it's a great example. If we drag hue to the right, you can see all the colors come into line, including her lips, which we don't want. So we're gonna fix that but from zero to 100, you can see that color range compressed down to that picked target. So let's pull up saturation as well. That would just mean anything that's more or less saturated will get brought together to that picked target. And the same for lightness, which we're gonna be careful with because it will just flatten off any lighting. So we're gonna keep that relatively low. So now we can see if we turn that layer off, so we just, doing the checkbox over here. If we turn that layer back on, we can see what's happening. If we go down to Danielle's arm, I think there's also a bit of a correction there as well. So it's working over the whole shot, but obviously we've got some undesirable effects that it's affecting lip color, it could affect makeup and so on. So we wanna put the correction at our discretion, if you like. So first of all, we're gonna right click on our skin tone layer and say clear the mask. That will get rid of the mask, but keep our lovely adjustments that we just made. Then we're gonna grab our brush 
Go over here, right click, let's pull the hardness down a bit. So it's nice and soft and maybe the size. And we're gonna keep the flow nice and low again because what that means is for an area that needs more correction, we can brush more. For an area that needs less correction, we can just do a couple of brushes. So if we go around here, back and forth, Again, it's gonna happen pretty gradually, so you might wanna stop every now and then, turn your layer off, see what's happening. Yep, we've got a good result. Do a little bit on the bridge of the nose, like so, and then just down here. And then if we go to Daniel's arm, then we can just fix a little bit down here as well, and so on. So you can brush this correction in anywhere. Uh, let's just make small correction here as well like so now if what i could have done if the skin tone here was like a vastly different or if the target skin tone was going to be a vastly different target to elsewhere there's nothing to stop you making another layer and doing the same thing so now if we turn our skin tone layer off and back on we can see the correction now there's no reason why you can't combine a style brush here as well in actual fact I don't like that I went so bright in the shadows, so I'm gonna darken that down a bit. But if I just wanna lift the right-hand side of Danielle's face, we're gonna use a nice speedy style brush. We're gonna grab Dodge for Brighton. And then as soon as I start brushing on the photo, makes a new layer, like so. Sets up the brush parameters, sets up all the settings. All of that is super speedy. And then I'm just gonna do a couple of little strokes there, nothing much, and then zoom into her right eye, make this smaller, and now I'm using a new shortcut, or newish shortcut, which I'll show you in a second, and then just open up her right eye a bit, and her left, because it was just a little bit on the dark side. So that shortcut to do the speedy brush adjust is simply Control Option on your keyboard, or Control Alt if you're on a PC, and then where's my cursor? And then when we drag left and right, we change the size. If we go up and down, we change the hardness like so. Uh, if you're on a PC, you need to right click with your mouse and then do the drag. And if we do shift control option like so, spider fingers, and do uh, left and right, we get opacity, up and down we get flow. So that's a much faster way for adjusting brush size than right clicking and bringing those parameters up. So just remember those. Okay, so that's where we're gonna leave Danielle. As I said, the main purpose was to show you the comparison between, let's get rid of uh, the keyboard, show you the comparison between quick fix with the style brush, more intense, highly accurate fix uh, with, the, with the skin tone tool. Um, the reason why, let's just look at our grayscale mask, option M. So again, keeping the flow nice and low means that in this area I didn't brush as much, so there'd be less of a correction. Here we did a little bit more. Um, here is kind of in between and so on. And always don't forget once you've done your corrections, you can always go back through your layers and then play with the opacity and balance it out again as well. All right, um, let's have a look at a couple of questions. Great question from Jose. Can I move the pick skin point in the color wheel or do I have to pick it once again? No, the good news is you can move it. So if we just do something silly for a minute, if I pick this up, this really demonstrates what the skin tone tab is doing. So if I were to drag it over here, you can now see Danielle's skin tone change immediately because it's pulling all those skin tones or everything in that color wheel to that point. So if I just put it back to something more sensible, then you can see the correction. But you can essentially pick the skin tone that you want. All the picker is doing is just choosing something on the subject that makes sense to gravitate towards. Okay. Blake says, loving the new style brushes. Nice, and love your work as well, Blake, that's for sure. Check Blake out, because he's got some fantastic shots. Okay, uh, the next one we're gonna look at was, how are we doing for time? Good, I'm faster 
this morning. We're going to counteract that with this nice environmental portraiture. Oh, that was Danielle, sorry. John McDermott uh, with some menacing looking Italian guys. Um, but I like this shot because it's got the nice environmental parts of it. And it's a good comparison over just a difference in dynamic range, whether that's because of exposure or camera model or whatever. Don't need to get into that, but this is a good example of a slightly different approach of pulling the sliders around. So this one's been edited. So let's just reset everything. So that's how it comes out of camera. There was an interesting um, article I saw the other day, a 10 step approach to editing in Capture One, which followed a step one, step two, step three, step four. I personally don't believe in that approach because I think every photo is different. If I was to follow any steps, it would be crop and rotate first, fix the exposure, and then it's a free for all after all that. So with this shot, with that in mind, I'm gonna grab the straighten cursor tool up the top, and we're gonna pick the woodwork along the back just to get our reference point. So let's go for that. And then also, just for the OCD in me to straighten up the door, I'm gonna grab the vertical slider on the keystone tool, and then we're just gonna pull that that way a touch, just so it straightens up that doorway. Probably unnecessary, but why not? Uh, Crop-wise, I think I'll crop out the leading edge of the table because there's a little highlight there. I love the fact that we've got a coat and a hat and more menacing looking things going on. So that's a good start point. Now for this shot, if we look over on his shirt on the right hand side, obviously it's a little bit too dark overall. So if I pull up the exposure, we can do so. But relatively quickly, you see we're starting to lose highlight detail on the right hand side. So personally, I would then think, well, what makes more sense? What about if we lift up the brightness? Is that better? If we lift up the brightness and the shadows, because it's predominantly shadow, that does a better job of just pulling up exposure. And if anything, if we now look at the highlights, I would just pull them down a little bit. So whereas in Danielle's shot, we had quite a lot of wiggle room on the highlights for that shot on this one, there's slightly less. So this one would then cause me to just lift the shadows. And because the shadows can make it a bit flat and boring, we can always pull the blacks down and that will darken those very deepest blacks. So to remember, the difference between black and shadows is that the blacks only operate on the very end of the histogram. The shadow slider is, if you like, the lower 30%. Highlights operate on the top third and whites operate just at the very brightest, like the top five, ten percent. So white and black gives you very fine control over the um, endpoints. Good comment from Anthony. I've found luma curve to be more precise as opposed to brightness. Absolutely. So brightness does a nice mid-tone bump. But if you really want to dial in, let's do it actually. If you really want to dial in a precise change, then you can of course use uh, the luma curve. So if we start with the five point all channels, then we can decide exactly which areas we want to brighten, darken, and so on. So I personally would still go for a bit of a shadow lift like we've got here. That doesn't matter in that respect. So let's lift up our mid-tones and let's bump up brightness a little bit as well and probably ease off on the blacks slightly. Now it looks a bit cold, so let's warm it up slightly. That's better, it wasn't really the cozy atmosphere I was going for. And the other reason for looking at this shot was to also think about color grading on a layer. And we're gonna do that with Brandy's photo as well. Brandy's is basically gonna be a sum of everything that we've looked at today pretty much. Um, but for this one, we do a quick color grade and also we can lift this slightly darker area of his face as well, as he's just slipping into a bit too much shadow. 
So first of all, if we want to color grade using the color balance tool, and as, as I said, we do this again with um, Brandy's picture as well, but I find color grading makes sense to work on a new field layer. So let's do that. And we call that color grade. Look at me, I wrote it in American English then. I'm slipping. Um, color grade, so used to typing uh, color for web stuff uh, spelled in the other way. Uh, so that's a, a field adjustment layer. So let's go and find our color balance tool. And really for these guys, um, I would prefer just in the master, just to add a bit more warmth, counteract that with the shadows going in the other direction. So you can see the more I pull that, we can see what's going on. So it doesn't need much, just a little bit. And maybe just to make sure the midtones keep their worth as well. And the nice thing about having it on a layer is that you could always play around with saturation as well. So let's take a bit of saturation down and increase our master overall. So I'm pretty happy with that. And as I said, the last thing to do, he's just, you know, 5% too dark or whatever. He looks pretty good. Nice modeling, uh, menacing face, but it's just ever so slightly too dark for my liking. So we're gonna do a quick fix with a Brighton style brush. So I'm gonna choose Dodge, go over to the shot, use the shortcut key to make this smaller. This one also, as you can see, has a nice low flow. And then we're just gonna one, two, three, four. It's probably enough to lift that up. And then maybe just one, two strokes on that side. And then if we zoom in a bit and now turn that layer off, before and after, like so. Again, looking at this dude, let's check his dodge out before and after. So just a little tiny lift, like so. Not much, but enough. Don't want to vignette this one because I like the accessories and the painting and the guns on the wall. So we're gonna keep that as normal. If we look at before, as we had it in the camera, so that was just an exercise of opening up the shadows using a luma curve. Uh, fixing the dark side on his face, making sure the highlights are controlled, and then a little color tweak at the end of it as well. Uh, let's go to a couple of questions. I think we're pretty much well handled actually. Um, Matt, I just saw Matt's comment there. Is there a good way to cool shadows while retaining a pure black shadow? You could actually map with a Luma mask. So, so on that layer that we did, the color grade layer, what you would do is do your Luma range, but you would say everything except the darkest blacks. And then that way, the very darkest blacks would not be affected. So if we, actually, what does that mask look like? So if we bring back Luma range again, so if we pull that up, so we can see those are the very darkest areas. You might want to um, play around with the radius in a bit just to make sure it's soft. But if we did that, and then now our color grading would be absent from the coat. So if we go back to the shadows and just massively pull this over, it doesn't have as much of an effect as you can see on the back wall. So that's how you would do it, Matt. That's actually a really awesome question, Matt. I'm glad I, I caught that one. It wasn't in the Q&A tab, so minus brownie points uh, for that. Um, but that's a really nice trick for color grading, actually. Uh, question from Dave in the webinar room. If you use a tablet with pen pressure, do you use the pen pressure option or do you prefer to leave it off? Um, I don't use it, to be honest, Dave. I'm not finessed enough to be able to do it and to be honest um, if we bring up the brush and right click having a low flow means it's just a gradual build up and then you don't need the manual dexterity to worry about pressure and also the tablet I'm using this one this one here is a, a Wacom Intuos Pro which has you know a billion levels of pressure sensitivity but you can buy a Wacom one 
which is the worst product name ever. Sorry, Wacom, because when you say, which Wacom do you have? And you say, I have the Wacom one. You go, which one? And you have that endless, ridiculous conversation loop. Uh, but the Wacom one is a, you know, it's a great deal. Uh, I think it's under 70 euros, dollars or whatever. But I don't believe that has any pressure sensitivity. So it's no good to you in that respect anyway. But keeping that flow low means that you get all the versatility anyway. Okay, um, drool. Good job I was out of shot then, drinking problem. Um, let's go to the next shot. So who was I gonna do next? I think we were gonna do a black and white. Yep, let's grab this one. And the reason, this is from my good buddy Kish. Um, this converts really nicely to black and white, so that's a reason for picking this one. And also, there's a couple of other little tricks that we can do, and we can also look at the heel brush as well. So, first of all, if I was to decide that I want to work with something as black and white, the first thing I would do would be to enable black and white. Now, if we'd already edited this shot in color, then my step would be to make a virtual copy by way of a clone variant. Might as well try and clone it and then convert to black and white and just judge if that made sense or not. But now that we've enabled black and white, the color channel sliders down here, forgot I've got my new toy again. The color channel sliders change the density of those colors. Now this is predominantly skin tone, of course, so there's a high chance that the red slider is gonna have the greatest effect. So if we pull that up or push it down, you can see the red's getting brighter and darker. Now I'm not gonna go crazy with it because we're gonna fix most of this with other sliders. Suffice to say, there's probably not a lot of green, cyan, blue, and magenta in this shot. So depending on the content of the photo, like if we go back to Joe's shot, Obviously, if we convert this to black and white, looks pretty good. Um, this slider is going to have a lot more of an effect, the green slider, because there's a bunch of green uh, in the shot. Uh, this one, I think down here, there's potentially a little bit. Yeah, so I could just darken that down if I wanted. But how active these sliders are wholly depends on the content of the shot. So now, uh, let's think exposure-wise. It's a little bit on the dark side. I would prefer this brighter, but her hair is actually a really nice tone, nice contrast, so we need to be a bit mindful not to ruin that. But I will lift up the brightness a bit. Being mindful of the right-hand side, let's make sure that doesn't get out of control. And to keep some nice depth and contrast, we're gonna pull the blacks down. The rest, we're gonna just dodge our way out of that just to lighten it a little bit. And also hands as well. What we could do, I don't know if this can, this will work well enough. I tried it this morning and I wasn't sure if I was totally happy with the result, but let's go again. If we grab the grad filter over here, let's go over to our shot, draw on the photo. Where I start drawing is where the mask is strongest. Where we finish drawing, that's where the mask has faded to zero. Now by default, it will be symmetrical. So if I press M on the keyboard, you can see the fall off. If I want this to be a harder fall off, you can hold down option on your keyboard. So you just need to hold option whilst you drag the top line down and then we can change the fall off. So now if I do that and then just pull up the exposure and brightness a touch, then I can just lighten her hands up as well. So if we turn this layer off, you can see before and after like so. And if we need to tweak this, let's pull that down a bit, then we can do so. So that helps a little bit. I'm gonna stick with that. Probably gonna crop out the bottom a bit, a bit too much negative space. So let's go for that. All right, um, the other reason for picking this shot is a little chat about sharpening. Now generally, and if you've watched any webinar live session, you very rarely see me play around with sharpening, mostly because I personally believe the defaults are actually pretty good. One thing just to keep an eye out for portraiture, and it, the same applies for brandy shot as well, because that's bang in focus and super sharp, is that often the default might be a bit too much for a portrait. 
So if anything, I'd just slacken this off a little bit. If we want to add some detail in at a later point, then we can do so with a layer, with a style brush or whatever on the features that, that would require it. So I'm just gonna pull this down a little bit because that's plenty, plenty sharp enough. I mean, we can see every strand of hair and eyelash and everything. So let's, uh, let's stop there. Okay, zooming back out again. Um, contrast wise, again, I'd probably, let's see what happens with clarity. So it just it doesn't generally look good because it's really acting on the skin tone and it's just gonna make any change in density more obvious. So what I want to do is make this a bit more high key. So a good old dodge again. So let's grab our dodge brush and we're gonna go much bigger, like so. And as soon as I start brushing, Capture One makes me that layer. So all automated, which is great. And then I'm just gonna gradually lighten up this area a little bit as well. And if you go too far, don't forget that we can always pull the opacity back a bit. Or if you switch to your eraser or E on your keyboard, but you can choose it here. And you've clicked this link, pair eraser with brush. It means that as soon as you switch to your eraser, it's going to keep all the same settings. So you can build up your layer or reduce the layer at exactly the same rate just by switching to the eraser. So now that I've gone to eraser, then I can take a bit out. If I press B on my keyboard for brush, then I can add a bit more in. I'm actually gonna leave that slightly darker area there and stay away from that. Let's just brighten up her hands a little bit as well, like so. And then again, turn your layer off and then you can see what we've done. Now, zooming in uh, to 100%, sorry, Cess, um, I'm going to grab the heel brush and just pick off, whoop, that's way too big, and just pick off a couple of these points here. Whack on stuck on right click again. Let's try that. There we go. Um, what do we got for flow? Let's bump the flow back up so it's actually working. Sorry, let's try escape. There we go. It's funny that that sticky modifier key bug was one that was present about two or three years ago and I haven't seen it since until I updated my driver which is a bit frustrating but there we go <laughs> so now we're just going to pick off a couple of these points you can have an unlimited number of points capture one will automatically pick that source point for you as you've seen it's very easy to use that shortcut to change your brush size um, once again maybe it's my keyboard that's sticky but I don't think it is doesn't appear to be there we go fixed and last couple you don't want to watch me do endless amounts not that it's needed if you move the cursor key off the viewer then the arrows disappear if you're doing a lot of, of uh, fixing then you can always hide the display arrows here as well but I find if I need a quick look, I just take the cursor off the viewer, have a check, and then see if I need to do anything else. So that's pretty cool. And the last thing that this photo looks really nice with is film grain. So film grain isn't applied on the layer. It, it will always default to the background, but let's choose a bit of soft grain. Let's float the tool out so we can see what we're doing. Impact is how visible the grain is, almost like an opacity, if you want to think of it that way. And granularity is how grainy it is. So I'm going to bump up the grain a bit, like so. And I think that pretty much does it. Do I want a vignette? I think the answer is probably no, but let's have a look regardless. Nah, don't want a vignette. So if we look at before and after, black and white conversion, very simple. Remember those sliders in the black and white tool wholly depend, or their sensitivity wholly depends on the content of the photo. Little bit of a dodge just to lift up the side of her face that was in shadow. A few little spots, not that she really needs it, fixing, and um, away we go. So nice, simple edit. Let's check uh, the questions. 
Um, do I use a mouse together with your tablet? No, I never, I never use a mouse at all. Actually, I use a tablet in daily life. I just find it more comfortable ergonomically. This mouse, this, uh, oh, sorry, wrong camera. This mouse is actually connected to another computer over there, which handles some live streaming stuff, which I won't bore you with. But generally, no, I never use a mouse. Uh, let's check for questions over here. Good one from Otto in the webinar room. What's the difference between uh, Brightness Plus and Dodge Brighton? Uh, same question we had this morning. Dodge Brighton does a number of things and there's no secrecy to it. If we select the layer and look what's happening, it's got a little plus two exposure bump, if I remember. Also a little curve shift as well. So it's doing a couple of things in tandem. All Brightness Plus does is bump up the brightness. So Brightness Plus is a good mid-tone tweak, but Dodge will actually open everything up to a lesser extent, but still with some highlight protection uh, as well. Uh, but good question. Um, Alan says, when converting to black and white, best to start from scratch. Not necessarily, like we saw with Joe McNally's shot, you know, that actually looks pretty nice black and white just by ticking the box. So, and we've, you know, the fact that we've reduced redness would probably help because if we pulled around the sliders, um, then it, you know, this red area might have had more of a change and so on. Uh, if we look at these dudes, if we just turn on black and white, it's not bad, I'd probably add a bit more contrast and, and so on. But if you think I'm only gonna do it in black and white, then yeah, we can start from scratch. Can you bring warmth into the black and white frame? Yes, you can. So what you can also do is if we add a new field adjustment layer, you can actually use the color balance tool. So you'll see if I just pull the sliders around or go for the master tab, uh, then you can influence the shot as well. So if we wanted to, you know, do that, whatever, just to varying extent, then we could do so as well. So you can triple tone using the color balance tool, which is also really nice. Is there a hotkey for showing hiding arrows in the heel layer? I'm pretty sure there is actually. So uh, if we go to, if you ever want to know if there is a shortcut for anything, Go to Edit Keyboard Shortcuts and just type a few logical things in the search term. So if I type arrows, there you go. Display heel and clone arrows. So yes, you can put a shortcut for that. Okay, how are we doing for time? Let's finish off with uh, Brandy, I would say. And then I'll just give you a quick look at the styles. So. Say hi, Brandy. I think she's hopefully still online. So let's reset. No, let's make a new uh, variant. So we've got Brandy shot. Let's bring up Brandy's deets on screen. So follow Brandy at Brandy Nicole Photo. Uh, Brandy's also got a YouTube channel, which she goes through full edits as well. So you can also see a working capture one and also moving on to, to post-production as well. So first things first, we're gonna straighten this up a little bit, ever so slightly, not that much. So just a tweak, and I'm gonna crop out the V-flats because we're not gonna retouch. So let's go and crop out the top one and the bottom one like so, and go a little bit tighter down here. So that's where we're gonna start from. Now, once again, if we zoom in close, sorry, Brandy, then same thing applies. This is really nice and sharp. Focus is spot on. So I'm just gonna back off the sharpening a little bit. If I wanted to, then we could dial a bit more back in on the features or we could sharpen our hair on a layer. You know, doesn't really matter, but, but the default is just a bit too much for this application. So let's back that off a little bit. Before we do anything else, exposure's pretty good. Brandy, let's just go slightly, ever so slightly warmer or maybe not that much, tiny bit warmer. If you want to do a tweak, we can just use our cursor keys or we can use speed edit. I saw someone, sorry, I missed your name, says, um, why am I not using speed edit? Mostly because you guys can't see what's happening. If I'm using speed edit, but we do it, 
when we show you the styles, then it's hard for you to follow. But otherwise, I use Speed Edit a lot. OK, um, what did I do with this photo? Let's just bring up the brightness a tiny bit. Sunny day. So I wouldn't bring down the highlights because that just kind of ruins the fact that it's a nice sunny window and it's not burning out. So I'm safe to bring up the brightness a little bit. We might control the highlights here if need be. But there's already some natural framing from the light. So let's improve on that by making this bit darker. So once again, for speed, we're going to grab, um, where are we, burn darken. Make our brush a little bit bigger. Once again, this is also set with a nice low flow by default. So let's just darken down this area just to build on that natural framing which already exists. So I'll just go a bit more into the corners. Now I probably did a better job of this when I wasn't so rushed, but you get the idea. And a little bit there. This area, actually, if I just do a quick wipe over there and there, we can also bring the highlights down a bit as well. So that's better. OK, so next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to do the skin tone trick again, although it's pretty, sorry, Brandy, it's actually pretty even, to be honest. Is it worth it? Let's just do it quickly so you remember the technique. So step one, new field adjustment layer. Step two, go to our color editor's skin tone tab. Grab your picker, this one here. Go and pick a good desirable skin tone. So let's go there like so. Widen out your color fishing net. That's our target color, remember. And then pull your hue sliders across and you can see the negative effect is that it's affecting Brandy's lip. So we don't want that. Let's pull up the saturation and be a little bit of the lightness, but not too much. So that dials in our correction. Now I can right click and say clear mask, grab a brush, it's probably enormous. So let's make it a bit smaller. And then the areas that we're just going to brush on is just pretty much around there. I think your arm's pretty good. Yep. Like so. Just to fix that bit and a tiny bit down there as well. So that dispenses with that. Let's grab the healing brush like you saw earlier and just pick off couple of points like that. I think we can probably also get rid of the highlight. Don't be mad at me, Brandy. Um, there's a little bit of a highlight there. So can we remove that with the heel? Let's see. Hasn't picked the best point, but remember we can always pick it up and shift it. So I'll try for something like that. There we go. That's better. It's just taking that highlight down and let's do one more right there as well. Oh, sticky cursor key again, or sticky modifier key. There we go. That's it. So that stops with that. Perfect. And then we were going to do something with the hair, as I remember. So as I said, clarity, not great for skin, just pulls around the contrast too much, but it does look nice on hair, especially if there's a bit of gloss. So we're going to make a new layer and call that hair gloss. And this time I'm just going to be speedy and we're going to do um, a rough or a fairly rough mask with max flow. So flow is going to and opacity are up to 100. And then we're just going to brush uh, on the hair like so. Not being especially careful, as you can tell. <laughs> uh, let's just make sure it's not going on the skin. We don't want that. Just nibble a bit away at the edge. So now we've got a mask just on the hair. So what we can do for that is just throw in a little bit of extra clarity, nice and slowly, just to get a bit more shine on it and be mindful we don't want to lose the highlights. So if I turn this off and then back on, then you can see the difference. That's probably a bit strong, so let's just back that off slightly as well. So that gives us a nice effect. Um, highlight may be a bit strong here. So we could either go back to our darken layer. And when you switch layers, the brush will always remember the settings for that layer, as long as you have the link brush with layer box ticked. This is a really handy feature. That is kind of a bonus feature from 
style brushes that if you tick it, notice how my brush changes size like so. So if I want to go back to my burn layer and then just darken this area down a bit, then I can do so. And I don't have to think, oh, do I have to change the flow back again? And so on and so forth. And then finally, we're going to add a new field adjustment layer. We're going to call that color with a U grade, like so. And I wanted to pull the saturation down a bit. And I think what I did yesterday was we had something, maybe not that much, something like that kind of thing. Just a slightly overall warmer look, a little bit more monotone, slightly tealy highlights like so. And we can mess around with that forever. But that's the lovely thing about the color balance tool is that it's just plug and play. What you see is what you get. There's no science involved. It's just dial in the colors um, that you like. So um, if we hit Y on our keyboard for our before and after, that's as it came out of camera. And then with the few little tweaks like so. And of course, once again, you can always go back through your layer stack and decide was I too strong anywhere and just dial back those adjustments if you want. <laughs> Noah, remove the U from color right now, but the, the British and the Canadians will be upset. So um, I'll alternate week to week. All right. Um, I don't know how this compares with the other ones I did. So three brandies in a row. Eh, it's, you know, it's very hard to edit exactly the same each day, but relatively, relatively close. So the last thing I want to talk about, let's take um, how are we doing for time. Oh, slightly almost overrun. Uh, let's make a new variant from this, so back to scratch. And if we have a look at styles, uh, we've got a couple of new style packs which came out today, like little mini style packs. Uh, we've got the lifestyle, which you can see down here, which uh, is based on, you know, Nordic color toning, I guess you could say. Each one has three contrast variations. That's why there's one, two, and three. And there's also an editorial pack, which is inspired by, inspired by Nordic editorial color grading. So it's got some nice color grading in those as well. So a really speedy edit for this one would be, so let's decide which one I like. Let's go for Oslo 2, quite like that. Now someone mentioned speed edit, so what is speed edit? If you're not aware, essentially you can hold down a shortcut key on your keyboard so you'll see now if I hold down A on my keyboard, if you look down the bottom, I can't highlight and speed edit at the same time, the highlights show up. And then all I need to do is just drag on my photo or use the scroll wheel of my mouse. And then anywhere on the photo becomes a giant slider. So let's hide that view. So I would just pull the highlights down a bit to make sure his beard is okay. Uh, grab a style brush, red skin reduction, Zoom in a little bit, just do a few strokes over here, like so. Edit done, like so. So apply style, quick speed edit, quick style brush, really nice result. The only other thing I, I might do is just open up the shadows a little bit as well. Whoops, not on red skin reduction, on the background. So let's just pull the shadows up using a speed edit as well and finish off with a crop. So that's uh, the new styles, uh, Nordic editorial and Nordic lifestyle. We throw up a link in um, YouTube and Facebook so you can find out about those as well. But really super nice little uh, simple pack. If you're in the webinar room, I'll just put a link up on screen for you as well that you can follow. So hopefully you should see um, a little link pop up in the webinar room as well. If you don't, uh, then let me know. Uh, okay, let's finish off with a first cup with the, sorry, the last few questions. Brandy says, oh my God, how did I not know the speed edit shortcut? So there's a bunch of tutorials on speed edit if uh, you have yet to see it. If you go under edit keyboard shortcuts, then you can find all the speed edit keys and you can also create your own. So even just for white balance, 
you know, Kelvin, if I hold down one on my keyboard, I've got the Kelvin slider, drag anywhere on the um, uh, screen, and that turns it into a giant slider wherever I drag. So I can drag left and right up here, I can drag left and right down here, I can two finger scroll on my trackpad, I can use my scroll wheel mouse, or I can use the cursor keys. So there's plenty of different ways that you can use speed edit. And of course, you can also do it on a bunch of pictures. So if we, not a black and white, if we just select uh, these few, try that again. Uh, let's just select these three. So if we've got three on screen and I wanna warm everything up by the same amount, hold down one on my keyboard and notice we get the Kelvin sliders under each one, one behind my head, and then drag anywhere on screen and then they're all changed by the same delta amount. So it's a, a you know great way of a speed edit, funnily enough. The clue is in the name. So let's just bring up the shots that we edited today. Stick those on screen. And last question, uh, what's the difference between the new lifestyle and editorial Nordic new styles? So have a look on the website, I think is my best advice, because there's quite a few examples up there. So the editorial style has a bit more color grading in there. That's That has its inspiration from editorial looks uh, that you often see, you know, Scan Scandinavian magazines and things. And then the Nordic style, again, slightly less color grading, inspired by the Nordics, muted color tones. They're just a, a really, really nice style pack, to be honest. But have a look on the website. You can swipe through some different styles. All right. Um, <laughs> Stephen says, where do I learn more about speed edit? So if you go to our learning hub, learn.capture1.com, you can find the tutorial up for it there as well. It says, I prefer you in color. <laughs> Actually, my saturation is down a bit, so I could I could always saturate myself as well. <laughs> there we go. Um, just checking the webinar room for any other questions. And let's, <laughs> what's the cursor toy? Did I say cursor toy and not cursor key? Cursor key, I am sorry. Um, do speed edits work on older keyboards? Yep, works on any keyboard. So it's not keyboard dependent. So I think you're referring to an old colored capture on keyboard we had. But no, this is a Logitech keyboard, works fine on that, works on an Apple keyboard, laptop, doesn't matter. All it does is just pick up that long uh, key press. Let's just check the Q&A tab. And I think we're pretty good. Oh, last question, good one from Amber, actually. Why does Capture One have default noise reduction at 50-50-50? Also a good question. So these values you see here, 50, 50, 50, this is what we determine as the best compromise between keeping details and removing noise. So it doesn't completely obliterate noise like on a super high ISO shot. We don't, none of these are super high ISO, so I can't show you. Um, but it's the best compromise between detail and noise reduction. Now, 50 sounds a lot, but think of that as almost that zero start point. Depending on the ISO that we're working with as well, there might be other stuff going on under the hood. So for each ISO, then there's careful tuning for noise reduction as well. So don't, just because it says 50, don't think that's a really high amount. It really isn't. Um, if we just bring up what's our noisiest shot? It's probably this one, if anything, because it's ISO 400. If we look into the shadows, let's open up our shadows a touch so we can see what's going on. So there's a little bit of noise. It's probably hard for you guys to see, but it's you know relatively clean, but it's not overdone. If I pull this down to zero, then we can start to see the noise creep back. But at 50, it's not really losing. You're not missing out on any detail is the best way to say it. So really think of that as, as a zero. Any raw converter will put some kind of default noise reduction in. The difference between Capture One and other raw converters is that every camera has its own bespoke sharpening amount and noise reduction amount. So it's tuned to your camera. So just don't be too obsessed that it says 50. It's a pretty good balance. But if you want to have less, you can dial them back and then you can say, 
save as defaults for my particular camera and that will give you a new default. All right, so don't forget to go and check out those uh, styles once more. Thanks to all our photographers again. So that was Joe McNally, we can spotlight you. Um, John McDermott, Brandy Nicole as starring as herself. Uh, Danielle Siobhan also starring as herself and Kish Saw as well. So thanks guys. Webinars are only possible with your photos. So thanks again for joining us. Don't forget if you're on YouTube and you want to be notified of when we're going online. I've got my fancy new animation, courtesy of Victor. Um, if you click the subscribe button in YouTube and the little dingly bell, then it just means when we go live, you'll get a notification on your phone, computer or whatever, when we go live and half an hour beforehand. So that way you're never gonna miss out. Thanks again for joining me today. Thank you for being great online in the questions and comments. So see you all soon. Take care, bye now.